So we've discovered that any strategy greater than 66 is dominated by 66. So as a player, if I was playing this game, so let me put myself into one of your shoes. It's, I would not play anything bigger than 66. Any strategy bigger than 66 is dominated by 66. So I would not play anything greater than 66. And just like the Sicilian, I would say, hey, wait a minute. I'm rational. I will not play anything greater than 66. And all my opponents, they're smart people. They're also rational. They would also do the same thinking. And as a result, they would conclude that any strategy greater than 66 is dominated by 66. Hence, my opponents will not play anything greater than 66. Okay. So what happens? Suddenly, the game has changed. I'm rational. I will not play anything greater than 66. You're rational. You will not play anything greater than 66. But that's not enough. Okay. I know that you're rational. So I know that you will not play anything greater than 66. And you know that I'm rational. And hence, you know that I'm not going to play anything greater than 66. So essentially, the game has turned into a game of choosing an integer between 1 and 66. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so all our strategy sets now is restricted to the set from 1 to 66. But if that's the case, if everybody plays 66, the average will be 66. Two thirds of the average is 44. So in this game, I'll call it the reduced game. Okay. Two thirds of the average will not be greater than 66, uh, 44, right? Hence, in this reduced game, 44 dominates any strategy which is bigger than 44. Because of that, I will not play anything greater than 44. Well, you're also rational, so you will not play anything greater than 44. And I know that, you know that, I know that. You're rational. Okay. So what happens? Now we're faced with a new game where everybody thinks that everybody else will play a number between 1 and 44. Well, if that is the case, the average could be at most 44. Two thirds of the average is, you have to help me out with calculations. I'm very bad at 19, well, let's say 19 something. Which means that 19 dominates anything greater than 19. OK? And just like the Sicilian, if I keep going on like that, what will happen? I will go all the way to 1. OK? Uh, when I looked at the bids when I was collecting, uh, this time there was only uh, I think two or three people who wrote one. Okay, so if this way of reasoning, we call this iterated elimination of dominated strategy solution concept. I'm not going to give the formal uh, definition. Uh, okay, so this iterated elimination of dominated strategies will lead to one. Uh, usually, when people play this game. The winner is the winning number. I don't know what this is going to be for this time, but well, I'll let you know next week. Something between 20 and 30. So what happens is that when people keep doing this, I'm rational. I'm not going to play anything greater than 66. I know that you're rational. You don't, you're not going to play anything greater than 66. But that's not enough. So the next step is so that we're playing all the same game. I know that you know that I'm rational. So. You know, you, you know that my strategy set is restricted to this set. So after some point, people stop saying, well, they cannot go any further. Okay, their rationality stops there and writes their number accordingly. So the ones, those who wrote one, are actually thinking very highly for the rest of the group. Okay? Uh, 
the ones who wrote a larger number was not thinking very highly about the rest of the uh, class. But I'll let you know what the distribution of the numbers are and who the winner is next lecture. But the idea here is, I'm rational. You're rational. I know that you're rational. Okay? You know that I'm rational. I know that you know that I'm rational. And then we keep going on like that at infinitum. That is called common knowledge of rationality. So when we say rationality is common knowledge, when we say we have common knowledge of rationality, it just doesn't say that I'm rational and you're rational and I know that you're rational, you know that I'm rational. It goes even further than that, okay? So this iterated elimination of dominate strategies and actually several solution concepts we have relies on common knowledge of rationality, relies on this long steps of rationality arguments. I'm rational, you're rational, I know that you're rational, and you know that I'm rational, and I know that you know that I know, and keeps going on like that, okay? Which in some cases, like here, it's not a very, uh, it's not an assumption that is always satisfied, okay? So we have to be careful when we're using solution concepts that we have, okay? Uh, we have to make sure that the assumptions are satisfied. People usually go two or three steps and then stop there, okay? So if a solution concept requires more than two or three steps of rationality, your predictions might turn out to be wrong. Yes, sir? Sorry? No, actually one is not a dominant. Uh, so in this game, I would recommend that you know, write a simple version of this game uh, and try to see what dominant strategy is. In this game, players do not have dominant strategies. They have strategies which are undominated. So in the first step, any strategy from 1 to 66 is undominated. Okay? Uh, and then in the next game and so on. But uh, in this game, players do not have dominant strategies. So if I was using the strict dominant solution concept, the dominant solution concept to make predictions or prescriptions, I will not be able to make any prediction or prescription. There's no dominant strategy solutions, solution for this game, okay? But this iterated elimination of dominated strategies leads to one, which only very few people play, and which in very, you know, I haven't seen anybody who played one and won this game, okay? But they should have won the sympathy of their friends because they were thinking very highly of the rest of the class. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? Okay. So, but what we see is, again, you know, for the second prize Hilbert auction game, we had a very exceptional situation. It was a game which had dominant strategy solutions. Most games don't. Okay? So what we have to do is we have to find other methods of making predictions or prescriptions. Iterated elimination of dominant strategies is one method, but as we see here, it didn't give out very good results, at least for this game, okay? So we have to find out new methods. But before we do that, let's work on another game. Uh, the Kurnos oligopoly. The Kurnow's oligopoly game. So the description was on the sheet that I gave you. Uh, Kurnow uh, was a French mathematician and philosopher who worked on problems of economics too. Actually, uh, I think he's the first person to uh, use general functional forms in economic analysis rather than taking specific functions and analyzing them. He was the first to take general functional forms, not specific functions, but functional forms, and construct models and analyze that and make predictions and using general functional forms. Okay? So what he said that the model he constructed was there was n firms. He actually, in a book he wrote, he starts with the monopoly and then goes to a duopoly and then takes the limit and whatever, you know, as the number of firms increases. We'll just start with his 
Algaba. So there are n firms. Each firm decides on the quantity that it will produce. So they choose a non-negative number. Okay, again, you should always specify what that symbol stands for, what this mathematical object stands for, where, where QI and SI uh, represents the action of producing QI units by firm. Okay. Always, even though it's clear to you, make a habit of writing down what those mathematical objects stands for. Okay. So each firm chooses a quantity, uh, decides on how much to produce, chooses a quantity to produce. That will give us the total quantity in the market. Okay. Uh, they decide on the quantity and they sell at the market clearing price. Okay, so the price at which this quantity will be bought. Okay, so we have an inverse demand function that gives the uh, price, the market clearing price of the good. They all, uh, by the way, when I add this, I'm rushing. Sorry about that. You know, by adding this, I'm actually assuming that. They're all producing the same good. So the good is a homogeneous good. Okay? Otherwise, addition would not make any sense. Okay? So each firm prefers a high profit to a low profit. Hence, we've done this before, so I'm going fast over it. Hence, pref profit, the profit function of each firm is a good numeric representation of the preference relation of each firm, which would be so rather than using UI, I'm going to use pi for profit. Okay. So that's the revenue of selling QI units at the market clearing price minus the cost of firm I of producing QI units. So he analyzed this game. We're going to do it. But to start with, let's start with a simple model. I'm going to consider the case where we have a duopoly. That is, we have two firms. Moreover, I'm going to assume, well, let me start with cost. I'm going to assume a constant marginal cost for each firm and the same. So I will assume for each i in n, ci of qi is equal to c times qi. I'll leave the general analysis to you, OK? So the marginal cost of produ production for firm i is c for each firm i, OK? So very simple model. We're taking it as simple as possible. And then we're going to assume that the demand or the inverse demand is uh, linear. So I'm going to assume something of the following form. Quantity in the market, price. So the demand will be of this form, scaled such that this number and this number, they're both alpha. Scaled it properly. So P of Q1 plus Q2 is equal to alpha minus q1 plus q2. Of course, negative prices doesn't make any sense. So what do we do? We take the maximum of this with 0. Okay. So the profit function of the firm is, in the Cournot duopoly, pi i q1 q2 is equal to qi times maximum of uh, alpha minus q1 plus q2 and 0 okay. minus cqi. Sorry? What, why do I? So why did we write the alpha minus q1 plus q2? Uh, so 
Q1 plus, so the demand, the inverse demand is of the following form. So P, if the total quantity in the market is Q, P of Q is equal to alpha minus Q. If L, Q is less than alpha, it's equal to zero if Q is bigger than alpha. So that's all I'm doing is representing this function graphically. By the way, I keep forgetting about this side. Can you guys read it? OK. Uh, maybe I should cut it from here. So you should remind me next time. OK? OK, so far so good? So that's the function. So we're done with the construction. I went fast over it because we did it before. So the next question is, does players have dominant or strictly dominant strategies? And to find them, the best thing to do is find best responses. Yes, sir? Well, alpha is just a scaling factor. What it means is that actually this is the saturation level in the market. So if there is more than alpha units in the market, and if you want to sell everything, you have to give it away for free. Okay? So you can think of it as the saturation level in the market. Okay? People will not pay for anything more than alpha units. Okay? Again, just say, so it's not, you know, in reality we would have something like this, but just a simplification so that the calculations would be easier. Okay? Sorry? It, it's so for every, so this gives you, so if you want to, if the total amount in the market is Q prime, and you want to sell everything in the market, you have to sell it at this price. So that's the demand relation or the inverse demand relation. OK? So far, so good? So as a game theorist, one of the first things I would look for is, is there any dominant or strictly dominant strategies? But we know that if we find the best responses, that will give us an easy answer for most problems, not always, but for most cases, Using the best responses, we can easily conclude whether there is dominant strategies or not, and if, if there is, what it is. Okay? So please find the best response of the firms. Best responses of the firms. Well, let me write B1, the best response of player one to the quantity, the decision of producing Q2 units by firm two is the set of maximizers So, that's it. It's a simple maximization problem. Do we have that tennis sheet going around? Okay. Did everybody sign? Thank you. Okay. So, what is the best response correspondence? Come on, come on, work on it. Take partial derivatives with respect to QI. Actually, once Q2 is fixed, there's only one variable, Q1, which rather than taking partial derivatives, you can take ordinary derivatives. But if you like to think about Q2 as a variable two, partial derivative. So one thing you can do is learn what you learned in calculus. Take the derivative equated to zero. But again, if you're using those techniques, you have to be careful. The points where the derivative is equal to zero gives you a candidate for being a maximizer. It doesn't give you the maximizer. It's only a candidate for the maximizer. You have to check whether the function you know, is concave. If it's concave, then that point will be a maximizer. But if it's not concave, then there's things that you have to worry about, OK? So again, guess what my recommendation is going to be for this problem? Picture, exactly. Draw a picture. Come on, draw the picture of this profit function. That's something you should be able to do fast, right? By the way, whenever I have a function like this, these max, min, all these things causes a headache. So 
I usually prefer to get rid of them. So rather than writing the function like this, let me go over here. I would prefer to write this function as the, of the following form. So the situation where the maximum is alpha minus q1 plus q2 and the situation where the maximum is zero. So if the maximum is alpha minus q1 plus q2, what do we have? That's q1 times alpha minus q1 plus q2 minus c q1. When is this the case? If the maximum is alpha minus q1 plus q2, that is if q1 is less than alpha minus q2, right? Okay, fine. And otherwise, otherwise this is negative, so maximum is zero. So otherwise it's c times q1. What, at, what if we have equality? What if q1 is equal to alpha minus q2? Well, then this number is also equal to zero, zero, zero. It doesn't matter which one you choose. So pick, put equality in one of them, let's say here, okay? So now this is simpler looking, but still it's partially piecewise defined. So what I would do is I would concentrate on one part first and then the other part, which would make life easy. Actually, I can even simplify this further. Factor out Q1, in that case what I would have is Q1 alpha minus C minus Q1 plus, actually let me write that here also, minus Q1 minus Q2, right? So now that's very simple. So what is this? I'll start with the easy one. That's a linear function, right? Passing through origin with slope minus C. So that's this function. Unfortunately, it doesn't behave everywhere like that. It behaves only when Q1 is bigger than alpha minus Q2. So let me mark alpha minus Q2 here. So beyond this point, the function behaves like a line. So I'll erase this part, okay? So in this region, the function behaves like that. What kind of an animal is this as a function of Q1? It's, it's a quadratic, right, in Q1. So the graph is going to be a parabola. All I have to know is where the roots are and whether the arms are up or down. Well, one of the root is at zero and the other root is at alpha minus C minus Q2. So that's, that's alpha minus Q2. So alpha minus C minus Q2. By the way, I forgot to mention, it was on the notes, but I forgot to say it now. We assume that C is less than alpha. So one root is here, one root is here. And the coefficient of Q1 square is negative, so. Well, it's an animal like that. Okay, so far so good? So. What is the maximizer? Well, that's a parabola. We know that the peak of the parabola is at the middle of the two roots. Alpha minus C minus Q2 plus zero divided by two. Okay, so far so good? So far so good? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Of course, this is the case as long as, well, one of the root is fixed. It's at zero. The other one changes with Q2, right? So actually, what I have is not a single picture. I have infinitely many pictures. And by looking at this picture, you should see all those infinitely. I, you know. I call this, you know, a frame from a, a fragment from a movie. Uh, when, 
we go to movies. We don't have too much time to do it anymore. But in the past, when you know, my wife and kids, when we used to go to movies, I would love to get in as early as possible so that you know, at the beginning, they show upcoming movies. They show small fragments from upcoming movies. Okay? And just by watching those small fragments, you get an idea about the whole movie, if the fragments are well chosen. So I, you know, I always like to watch them, because in five minutes, you watch like six, seven, eight movies. It's very efficient. The same thing here. This is a big movie. Q2 changes from 0 to infinity. And as Q2 changes, the movie changes. So let's see how it changes. My wife and my kids make fun of me because I don't like, I don't like missing the beginning parts. You know. They say we don't have to rush. And I say we do have to rush. I want to watch the upcoming movies. Okay. So that's the picture that we have, actually. Why doesn't it? Okay. After a while, it's linear. And as Q2 changes, what happens? You see, this is how the movie plays. This is only a fragment from the movie. This is how the movie plays. So after one point, uh, I, one point, what happens? The other root moves to this side, to the negative side. Alpha minus C minus Q2 becomes negative. And when it's negative, the maximum is no longer the maximizer is no longer the midpoint of the roots. It's, it's zero. Because we're maximizing over the strategy set of player one, which doesn't involve negative numbers. Okay? So just by looking at this picture, we can conclude that B1 of Q2 is equal to what? Sorry? It's the midpoint. It is. Alpha minus C minus Q2 over 2 if, if this number is still positive. That is, the root is still on this side. That is, if Q2 is less than alpha minus C. Otherwise, What is the maximizer? It's just zero. Exactly. OK? So far, so good? OK? So pictures, if you know, you, most students, they just take derivatives equated to zero and find this answer and say that this is the best response. It is the best response for a certain region, but not the best response over all possible values of Q2. Okay, so you have to be careful about that. Okay, so looking at this, does firm one have a dominant strategy? Does firm one have a dominant strategy? Come on. No, right? It's the best response changes with Q2, so the intersection is actually, the intersection of the best response is actually empty, right? Actually, we can also draw the picture, let's do that. So if I draw the picture of this, if Q2 is bigger than alpha minus C, the best response of firm 1 is equal to 0. So we mark these points. If Q2 is less than alpha minus C, that is if we're in this region, the best response is given by alpha minus C. The best response of player 1 is alpha minus C minus Q2 divided by 2, which is a linear function of Q2, you can easily show that that's this region is this, uh, can be displayed with this line. So that's the graph of the best response correspondence of player one. Okay. So drawing vertical lines, we see that the intersection is empty. Okay. So far so good? So far so good? Okay. So there's no dominant strategies. There's no strictly dominant strategies. What to do? Well, 
let's try the iterated elimination of dominated strategies thing, OK? So let's try to find out which strategies of player one are dominated. So then we will know that player one will never play those because they're, they're dominated strategies. You know, it means that there's always something better than them, the strategy which dominates it, right? So let's try to find dominate the strategies of player one. Okay? So it's not like I will predict. So what, if I find them, what I will say is that I will be sure that player one will not play those strategies. Okay? What will he play? I don't know. But I'm sure that he will not play those strategies. Okay? So which strategies of player one are dominated? Player one for, uh, okay? So these strategies are never best responses. But being never best response, does it mean that they're dominated? Does it mean that they're dominated? Yes? yes? Well, let's see, for example. Well, actually, I'll keep it even simpler. So T is the only best response to L. M is the only best response to R. B is never a best response. Is B dominated? No. B is also undominated. So being never a best response doesn't mean that a strategy is dominated. Yes, sir? If fm1? Mm -hmm. It will have a negative profit. Will that be the case? Well, okay, so how do you see that? For that? Okay. So, why Q2 equal to zero? Why not something else? So when you're looking at domination, it's not only zero. You have to look for every strategy of the opponent. Not only zero, but every strategy of the opponent. Okay. So there are several ways to go. But your friend has a suggestion looking at the profit. You see, for example, what I can do is, so you started with alpha minus C over 2, right? And take something bigger. So when Q2 is equal to 0, as your friend suggested, this is what you have. As Q2 increases, what happens to this movie? The peak of this parabola will shift to the left. Okay, It will keep moving like this. So this is the profit that the firm will get when he plays alpha minus C1 over 2. This is the profit that he will get when he plays a strategy bigger than alpha minus c over 2, right? So this profit is bigger than this, right? Still bigger, still bigger, still bigger, still bigger. So as long as the peak stays on the left of alpha minus c over 2, we know that the value of the function at alpha minus c over 2 is always going to be bigger than the value of the function at q1 prime where q1 prime is any number bigger than alpha minus c over 2. OK, so far so good? So that's what your friend's idea, which we take a little further. OK, so you can do this, show this mathematically. But again, this is a one power of the pictures. Both profits are negative, but this is bigger than this. OK, so far so good? So far so good? OK. so. Alpha minus C1 over 2 actually dominates any strategy bigger than alpha minus C1 over 2. Actually, if you look at this picture, it's not only domination, it's strict domination, right? Right? Okay? Yes, sir. 
Frame two. Uh -huh. Well, there will be intersection, but what would that intersection mean? And that's where we're going to come. Okay, but let's for now concentrate on this. Okay, so any strategy of player one in this region is dominated, strictly dominated by alpha minus c. Okay, so far so good. So if frame one is rational, you will never play a strategy in this region. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Okay. Uh, actually, there's another way to see this, and I'd like you to, I like, you see, I want you to learn techniques too. That's why I would like to look at this problem in a different way. Rather than drawing the profit function, let's draw ISO curves. That is, curves on which the profit is constant. It's like indifference curves for, you know, so let's draw the indifference curve of firm one where his preferences are represented by profit functions. What does the indifference curves look like? Come on, give it a try. It's going to be interesting. But just by looking at this picture, we were able to see that alpha minus c over 2 strictly dominates any strategy of producing uh, more than alpha minus c over 2. So what does the indifference curves of firm 1 look like? ISO profit curves of firm one look like. Sorry? We assume that alpha is bigger than C. Yes, the marginal cost. Okay. Otherwise, this number would be negative and the best response will always be zero. It will not be an interesting game. So again, what are we looking for? We're looking for points for which pi one of Q1 Q2 is equal to some constant k. Okay. So you want to draw the, you want to mark all the points on which the profit of firm one is constant. What does it look like? Come on, give it a try. What does it look like? Come on, come on. Anybody? Uh, so write down your profit function. What is the profit function? What did I have here? Less than. Less than alpha. Well, if Q1 plus Q2 is constant, this will change with Q1. So, which means that the profit will change with Q1, unless Q1 plus Q2 is equal to this number, right? What does this animal look like? Anybody have a rough picture and would like to share it with me? Anybody have a rough ship picture? That would... Well, again, it's not an easy function. But the first thing I noticed, so this is what we're trying to, you know, on this plane, uh, on this quadrant, we like to draw isoprofit curves. The first thing I notice is that the behavior of the function changes with respect to, you know, if Q1 plus Q2 is bigger than alpha and less than alpha. So maybe what I should do is break the whole region into two pieces. The region where Q1 plus Q2 is bigger than alpha, the region where Q1 plus Q2 is less than alpha. Okay? Right? Because the behavior of the function changes. So let's start with the easy one, this case. In this region, how, what does the ISO curves look like? ISO profit curves look like? Exactly. You equate this to a constant, okay, which means that Q1 is equal to K minus K over C, because C is positive. 
Okay. Okay. So far, so good. Which is just a straight line. So this is an ISO curve, ISO profit curve. This is what an ISO profit curve of firm one looks in this region. This is another one. This is another one. This is another one. Okay? So far, so good? Okay? By the way, whenever you draw indifference curves, isoprofit curves, you should always put an arrow indicating the direction of preferred alternatives, preferred strategy profiles in this case. So in which direction should I put my arrow? So if I compare this strategy profile and this strategy profile, how does firm one compare them? The one on the, which one is, so is this point preferred, is A preferred to B or B preferred to A? A preferred to B, right? Because we see as K increases, we get a more preferred alternative. But we have a minus here. Because of that, things are right. So the direction of the arrows is in this direction. OK? So far, so good? So half gone, have to go. So the next thing is draw the graph for this. OK? What does that look like? Well. I need more room. Let me erase this part, just concentrate on this. So what do we do? We equate Q1, alpha minus C minus Q1 minus Q2 to some constant K. So if Q1 is different than zero, whenever you're doing division, you have to make sure that you don't divide by zero. You get alpha minus C minus Q1 minus Q2 equals to K over Q1. By the way, which means that I should analyze the situation where q1 equal to 0 separately, OK? Uh, which means that q2 is equal to alpha minus c minus q1 minus k over q1. So what does that animal look like? Our time is running up. What does that animal look like? Sorry? Well, this part is linear. This part is hyperbolic. OK. Very good. Exactly. So your friend is doing the following thing. You see, you're adding two things. When Q1 is small, this number is going to be very big. So this term will dominate this term, which means that the function will behave like a hyperbola. For small Q1, it will behave like a hyperbola. For large Q1, so th this thing will be negligible. So it will behave like a line. And depending whether k is positive or negative, you know, you would be adding or subtracting, OK? So what will happen in the small region, it will behave like, well, first, let me draw this line, alpha minus c minus q1. Well, actually, let's stop here. Try to complete this picture. I'll give you a clue so your friend had a good idea. So this blue dashed line actually gives you this part. Okay. So mix this with the hyperbola part based on your friend's suggestion. We don't need an exact picture. We want a picture which gives us an idea on what's going on. Okay. Any questions? That's it. Have fun. <laughs>